Hello, it's Scott Manley here with another episode of Deep Space Updates. There's been a lot going on and I've been actually, uh, haven't done one of these in a couple of weeks because I've been really busy with the new house and building stuff for cats and things like that. But yes, tonight, Monday night, please, if you're interested, uh, you should check out SpaceX's Starship Hopper. The plan is to fly this to 150 meters. That is what the FAA is allowing them. Their test flight uh, requires 150 meter ceiling. They can fly, actually they can fly as many flights as they like up to 25 meters, but 150, they're only allowed one flight uh, with less than 30 metric tons of fuel. And I'm not sure how heavy the Starship Hopper is, but with the specific impulse of the Raptor engines, it's reasonable to assume that they can get between one and two minutes of flight time out of that amount of propellant. That being said, it's big. 30 tons of propellant is not a joke and the as in addition to the road closures the no tams uh, there was a flyer went out to residents of the nearby town saying by the way if this goes sideways literally there might be a significant overpressure event that could shatter windows uh, please don't be inside while this is happening you'll have a 10 minute warning so Boy, you know, this will be interesting. Now, this could, uh, it sounds like this is going to be the last flight for the hopper. Um, so they're going to strip it down and start flying the regular Starship prototypes. Still from Boca Chica, because they're certainly not going to be able to fly this uh, out of their location in uh, Florida anytime soon with uh, the FAA being so wary. Although, I imagine that once they get more than one engine on it and they can demonstrate engine out capability, they'll be allowed more uh, leeway. Oh, yes, another thing that came out of the FAA permit is the insurance has risen from $3 million to $100 million that they have to have on hand in case, you know, something serious happens. I'm hoping nothing serious happens. Um, so yeah, elsewhere over the weekend, we had Soyuz MS-14, and this was a fascinating launch for all sorts of reasons. First of all, this is the first Soyuz spacecraft launch on top of the newer generation Soyuz 2.1A. That was the Soyuz that's been upgraded. It has a digital control system. Unlike all the previous Soyuz launchers, it doesn't need to be rotated on a platform to its launch azimuth. It just launches and then rolls and then takes off in the direction. But uh, because this was the first crewed flight, uh, or for the first flight of a Soyuz crew capable capsule, which has a uh, an abort system on it, they want to check it out, make sure it flies. So it doesn't have a crew on it, except that it does. It has a robot called Fiddler on board who is sitting in the center seat. This humanoid robot is going to fly to the ISS and do like a couple of weeks of testing up there. I don't know if they're going to do like remote operations or whatever with it, but it's kind of cool to see this uh, in the pilot seat uh, or the commander seat and have it, you know, moving its head, looking around. I thought it was funny as well that they also, they still included the soft toy zero g meter which is common on these soyuz anyway it got to the space station and then it couldn't dock there was a problem with the coors docking system um so they backed off as they troubleshooted the problem and they figured out that the actual the docking system on the soyuz was fine but there was a problem with one of the antenna on the ploisk module that they were going to dock to so the Instead, what's going to happen is the um, they're going to take the, they, well, they already did this. They took the crew of MS-13, their Soyuz was docked to Zvezda. So they all got in their spacesuits, they got in the Soyuz, they undocked, and they very carefully flew around the station. Now, I know this is a one-person job, but they put everyone in that Soyuz ready for return to Earth just in case they then have problems docking to the station so that there's everyone at least has a lifeboat available at all times. So that docking went and it happened. It looks great. And yeah, we're going to see if tonight we're going to see if Fedora actually gets to the space station. Obviously, this is not great from a point of view of a human cyborg relations because, uh, you know, we've just created a Cylon and he's been flying a spaceship and he's been stuck in a Soyuz for several days and that is not something I would wish on <laughs> many people. Specifically being stuck, stuck in the center seat of a Soyuz for several days. And if you've seen the pictures, you just know how crushed up those pilots are. Uh, elsewhere in the world, uh, Ukraine 
has demonstrated uh, their RD8 8461K, oh, I forget the number. Anyway, there's some cool footage of them testing an upper stage engine. This was going to be for their Cyclone 4 launcher, which then got cut down after funding issues to the Cyclone 4M. I think what they're looking for is international partners, so any demonstration of this technology will obviously be some progress in that direction. Europe gets a shout out because Ariane Space has picked up a launch from another provider. The Ovzon 3 satellite from a Swedish company was going to fly originally on the Falcon Heavy and it was going to use that Falcon Heavy's direct injection capability where they could relight the upper stage after six hours to put it directly into geostationary orbit. But somewhere along the line, someone at Ariane Space has managed to put together a better deal. It's not going to be an as capable launch, so I'm not sure how this works out, but somebody has clearly done the math and done the dealing, and we're going to see one less Falcon Heavy launch. What we're also going to see less of is Delta IV launches, the very last Delta IV medium launched with the GPS-3 satellite. Now, to be clear, the Delta IV medium is the single stick version, in this case, they had two solid rocket motors attached to it. The, fall, uh, sort of the Delta IV Heavy is this one where you strap three Delta IV cores together into a single giant beastie, and it is the heaviest launch vehicle that ULA currently offers. ULA, if you remember, was formed by essentially taking the rocket divisions of the people that ran the Atlas and the Delta and putting them together, and the problem in that situation for Delta was that Delta was way more expensive because it used liquid hydrogen fuel and, it, and because it would then fly less, it then became even more expensive. So there's now only a very small number of launches that need that. Um, so the Delta IV medium is also kind of the last link to the previous generation of Delta rockets, the Delta III, which didn't fly very much, but the the fairing and the upper stage on the Delta IV medium are identical to the fairing and upper stage on the Delta III, which, and you know, the Delta III had the tank from the Delta II, etc., etc., etc. But yeah, so it's kind of, Delta IV is becoming even more removed from the Delta heritage. The, the last Delta II flew uh, last year as well. But what is coming in ULA's future is the Vulcan. And in the last few weeks, we've found out what the payloads in the first couple of missions are going to be. Astrobotic is launching a spacecraft to the moon, and that is going to be a payload on the very first Vulcan launch. It's not clear if this is the only payload, but obviously, uh, you know, this is a, a new rocket, a lot of risk, but they've got a commercial customer for it. The second launch is going to be the first flight of Dream Chaser. So that is one to look forward to. That's going to be another... That's going to be a commercial space plane, as opposed to that super secret X-37B, which we're all interested in, but Air Force won't tell us anything about. And since we're talking about US Air Force contracts, there is, of course, the process right now to pick the next two providers for the US Air Force, and the competitors are SpaceX, ULA, um, Northrop Grumman with their... Um, Omega rocket and Blue Origin. And Blue Origin, in anticipation of the award not going to them, have already filed a protest saying that the uh, system for choosing potential providers isn't fair, it discourages competition, it produces a duopoly, etc, etc, etc. So I don't, I think they're anticipating that they're not getting it, but that's going to be an interesting one to watch whenever it comes out. I think the, well, this, you know, this, um, this legal challenge will be heard properly in November, but I'm not sure when the, uh, the award comes out. Regardless, it's an interesting time. India has made it to the moon with Chandrayaan-2 finally entering orbit and sending back a bunch of photos. So it'll be there for a couple of weeks as it slows down, gets itself into a circular orbit, low orbit, and then it'll land and we'll be looking forward to that in September. And I'll, I'll, I hope I'll get to cover it live then. But until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.